If you've been with us the last few weeks, uh, we've been studying This Is Us, and we've been talking about who we are as the Choctaw Church of Christ and what we're all about. And you're probably thinking, how in the world can we have another lesson from this passage of Scripture? I mean, we've been here enough. The same, we've had the same Scripture reading for, for <laughs> weeks and weeks on end. This is the last one, okay? You're done after today. We will never go back to Acts 2. That's not true. Um, <laughs> that'll probably be referenced every week. But uh, this is the last lesson of This Is Us. And if you've been with us so far, we've talked about how we have been brought together only through Jesus and how we have been created into this family, that God calls us into this community. And that's not a family by name only. We live and act together as a family because we are one. And God wants us to do this faith journey together. And as a family, we are all in or devoted on Scripture. When it comes to what the apostles taught and the teaching of God's Word in the New Testament, we follow it and we're devoted to it. And it guides us as a body of people. And then last week we talked about how we're generous because of our understanding and appreciation for what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. So we are generous to other people. And if we stopped right there, that would have been pretty good. But I think we would have missed a very huge part of what we're to be all about. Because if we'd stopped right there, we'd be quite inward focused. A lot of what we've talked about has application to how you and I live and interact together. But we haven't talked as much about what our duty is to those people outside of our family. And how we are all about the salvation of souls. And we're all about taking this wonderful message of Jesus that has touched and changed our lives and influencing others to hear that same message, sharing that message with all of those in our community because we want people to know good news. It's good news, isn't it? Amen. It's the best news. And when it comes to this early church, they were all about sharing the good news. Now, if you looked at that passage that Kendall just read for us, you don't really get an evangelism plan in there, do you? There's not a whole bunch said about how they shared the gospel, but yet you get to the end of the passage and it says, and day by day, people were, were being saved. Well, they're, they're being generous and they're being a family and they're devoted to worship and to the study of God's word and they're doing all these things, but I never saw in the passage where they were going out and preaching the gospel, where they were sharing the message, and maybe that wasn't mentioned explicitly because it was expected. Because in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus told his apostles, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And those men witnessed, as we read in our first study of this passage, and they witnessed to these individuals and they shared the gospel and they obeyed it. And maybe it was just a given that as witnesses created witnesses, they would follow along suit and share the gospel with other people. And so their faithfulness to God and being the church family and being generous and being devoted to Scripture, sure, that plays a very integral part to sharing the gospel. Our faithfulness matters. It influences people. But it requires more than just simply how faithful we are as a church in terms of how we treat one another and how we're generous and what we're devoted to. It, it takes something and it requires something of us to share the message. This morning, our last we are is that we are contagious. I hope that word paints a picture in your mind. We are contagious. Christianity is infectious. I believe that wholeheartedly. Yes, men have opposed it and men have denied it since it began, but men have also been attracted to it since it began. Uh, we hear that word contagious, and we probably have negative connotations for it. I mean, we just went through a pandemic, right? I, I don't want to hear this word anymore. Don't you dare say the word virus, John. I'm tired of it. That virus originated in one part of the world and rapidly spread to our side of the world and affected our own community, and we, were, we experienced it. Well, in the same way, 2,000 years ago, this faith started in Jerusalem. And it spread rapidly to the ends of the earth. And 2,000 years later, it is still as contagious then or today as it was then. People want to hear the good news. And there are individuals who are desperate for it. And then when they hear it and believe it and obey it, it lights their world on fire. I think of that man, Brandon. I got to spend some time with this weekend. He's on fire. It's encouraging. 
And there are individuals like that in our community, in our state, and all around the world because Christianity is contagious. In the same way that a virus is spread through our speech and you know, droplets in the air and coughing and sneezing and all of that, and through contact and, and touch, Christianity is spread quite similarly. Through our influence with other people and the way our lives impact them and the way we live and by how we speak, we influence people with Jesus and people will obey. I'm not telling you this morning or suggesting that our whole community is going to want to become Christians. I'm not suggesting to you that we're going to live in a nation that just wants to be Christian. That's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is that we have a mission to share the gospel. And I promise you, if you share the gospel with people and you live out the gospel faithfully, there will be people who take an interest. Because people have a sin problem. And there is good news about the hope of Jesus Christ. Look at Acts chapter 3. Because when it comes to being contagious and spreading the gospel, what do we need to do as a church? Do we need to build, build, build a big building? Say that five times fast, really quickly, and see if you can say it correctly. Do we need to build a big building? Do we need to remodel everything? Uh, do we need to have the perfect evangelism program? Uh, what did the early church do? I'm not saying those things to knock those. But what is it that the church did? Well, simply this, they were bold. Christians in the book of Acts were bold. And that's because Christianity does not spread without boldness. That's the one point to remember this morning. Christianity does not spread without boldness. Right after it says day by day these people were being saved, you pick up in Acts chapter 3, and we find Peter and John going to the temple when they encounter this lame man, this crippled man at the gate. And they interact with him, and they perform a miracle where he is now jumping and leaping, and he enters the temple with them. And everyone is amazed because they've seen this guy before. They've seen him, they recognize him as the crippled man, but he's not crippled anymore. And so they obviously ask questions and they're in amazement and wonder. And Peter and John take the opportunity to share the gospel and pick up in Acts chapter 3 and verse 12. It says there, And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name by faith in his name, he has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent. Repent and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. You want to pause right there for a moment. Christianity does not spread without boldness. Uh, did you see some of the, the truths that Peter and John just said? First of all, they're going into a community that has already had strong opposition to Jesus. I mean, this community had many people within it that just put him on a cross. And yet they go back into this community, not sometime after the death of Jesus, and they proclaim that message again. And he says, they say things like, he was the son of God, or he is the son of God. And you denied him, and you killed him, and you put him on a cross. In fact, you traded him for a murderer. Oh, and he's resurrected. And you need to repent. Is that bold to you? Is that courageous to you, to go into someone else's territory or to where they are and to share that message with them? Yet yeah, that's exactly what Peter and John are doing. They are courageous in telling the story of Jesus to these people. And so they, they go and they share it. Into this community that has opposed Jesus, many loved Him, many hated Him, and they share that message. And there's a response I want you to notice. Look at chapter 4 and look at verse 4. 
It says, but many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Now, if you remember in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, we find out it's about 3,000 individuals who obeyed the gospel. So we have about 3,000 Christians in Jerusalem. You fast forward a chapter, we go from 3,000 to 5,000. How did we get there? What did they do? The only thing you see in between is a faithful church that is bold. They are bold in sharing the message, and that brings about more Christians knowing the gospel, more people becoming Christians. It's boldness, and this boldness had consequences because look at the reaction. Look at verse 5. Peter and John in verse 3, it says they were arrested in verse 1 through 3 of chapter 4. People, the rulers didn't like the message. They're arrested. They're held overnight. The next day, they have a conversation with these individuals who've arrested them. And let's pick up in verse 5. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead by him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Pause. These influential leaders who have influenced already in the Gospels, as we noticed, to hinder Jesus the message, so they thought, and to kill Jesus, these ones have a problem again with the message they're sharing. And when Peter and John have the opportunity to back down, they double down. When they had the opportunity to back down, they doubled down. When there was potential repercussions, when people of power and influence disagreed or didn't like what they were sharing and what they had believed in and what they were living for, they did not back down one bit. They were ten toes down, and they kept doing it. They kept sharing, I believe it, I'm committed to it. They're bold. They're courageous. And look at the reaction once again of these leaders because they see it in them. Look at verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. They're astonished that they're not backing down. They're astonished at the faith they have in Jesus and the boldness they have in sharing his story and his message. And it says they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Quick thought for you. Could people recognize you have a relationship, a relationship with Jesus based off your boldness? Or would people not recognize it? It's an it's a inter interesting question to ask ourselves. Could people recognize that I've been with Jesus in a way based off how bold I am in my life for Christ, in my living faithfully, and in my speaking about His story? Could people recognize that? But keep reading, because their reaction, they're angry, says, uh, but seeing the man who, at verse 14, who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Oh, they wanted to say something, but they couldn't. Verse 15, when they commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For a notable sign has been performed through them, is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, and this is really key this morning. Look at this. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot speak but what we've seen and heard. We cannot speak but what we've seen and heard. Hey, there's going to be repercussions. We'll throw you in jail. We'll hurt you. We might even kill you. We, we will persecute you. You must stop talking. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not really sorry, but I can't. 
I got to share this message. It's the best message that there's ever been. It's true, and everyone needs to hear it. We have a God who's coming to the earth and saved souls, and he's died for people's sins, and without him they are lost. People have to hear this message. When they have the opportunity to back down, every time they double down, they're bold. And it was through their boldness that the church grew. Look, the church did not grow in all comfy environments. It grew through persecution. It's very interesting in the book of Acts. When you see an, a heavy opposition to the church, most often you see a growth in the church. Isn't that interesting? We sometimes think if everyone would be more comfortable with the message of Jesus, man, the, this thing would grow. Maybe it's, it is if we would be bold in a culture that might be opposed to Jesus, the church would grow. It's boldness that spreads Christianity. And without it, Christianity doesn't spread. And this morning, as we talk about being bold, I want us to understand what we're talking about. Boldness means a few things. When I say we need to be bold, this is what that means. It means we need to care more about what God thinks than what the world thinks. Amen? We have got to care more about what God thinks than the, what the world thinks. Growing up, I was always the person, I'm still this person in many ways, who I want people to like me. Is anyone else that way? I don't know a lot of people who would say, I don't want people to like me, but you get the idea. They, they, I, that's who I am. If you don't like it, I don't care. That wasn't me growing up. I wanted people to like me. I wanted to have a bunch of friends. I wanted people to uh, think I was their buddy. And it really bothered me. I mean, it really bothered me when people didn't like me. I didn't know why sometimes, you know, when there was that bully in school or if someone insulted you or you just didn't get along with somebody. That bothered me because I wanted everyone to like me. And I'm afraid some of us as Christians, we want everyone to like us. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. I'm not saying our goal is for people to not like us. Hey, let's go be really rude to a bunch of people. That's Christianly, right? That's, that's just like Jesus. Hey, let's go be the guy on the corner of the college who just every time someone walks by that I don't know, say, turn or burn. That's not what I'm saying this morning. <laughs> but if we think we can be effective for Jesus, but also wanting the world to like us, we're mistaken. Right. Jesus told his apostles, if the world hates you, Know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Christians, the world is going to hate you. Get used to it. People aren't going to like that you don't believe in all the ideas and all the ide ideologies that they stand for. People don't like that you're not going to conform to their way. People don't like that you go against the status quo. They don't like that you stand for what Jesus stood for, and they're going to hate you for it. And that's okay. Because they hated Jesus. Do we deserve to be treated any differently than Jesus did? If they hated Him, they're going to hate us. If we're faithful to His cause, they're going to have problems with that. We have got to stop seeking acceptance from a world that would never accept Jesus and instead be most concerned with seeking His acceptance. They might not love me, but I have a God who does. I'll keep following His way. If you want to be loved by the world and man, you're going to have a hard time trying to fit that in with being loved by God because you're going to be on a fence and you're really going to be on either, neither side. You can't love the world and everything in it, and the world will never love you if you're not of the world. So if we're going to be bold, we have to care more about what God thinks than what the world thinks. That also means we are more concerned with individual souls than their feelings. What's that phrase? The truth hurts. It hurts. And we don't want to offend anybody. I hate when I make people upset. I don't like that. I get anxious. It bothers me. i got to fix that right away. I don't like that feeling of offending somebody or hurting their feelings. And so maybe we shy away from saying something we should, or we shy away from a confrontation that might be healthy of some sort. We're not going to say that truth because I don't want to hurt their feelings. But if the gospel is true, shouldn't we say something to them? 
if Jesus is real and he died and he resurrected and he is the salvation for all mankind, isn't sharing that message that can save their soul better than hurting their feelings for some time? I'm not saying the way we say it should be rude. And I'm not saying we should be rude in our behavior as we tell it or we do it for the wrong reason. That's not what I'm talking about. When I say sharing something that hurts their feelings, I mean sharing the truth as in the gospel, not our opinion, not our thoughts and ideas that really aren't what Jesus is talking about when he says speak, or when Paul would say speak the truth in love. The gospel message, is it not worth sharing that? If we care more about somebody's feelings than about their soul and their eternal destination, may I suggest we don't care about their feelings? Because if we really care about them, what do we tell them? Doesn't that step on our toes? Because how many people do I tiptoe around important conversations with them? Because I don't want to offend them. Well, maybe they'll never be my friend again. Or they'll cut off communication. It's tough. I'm not saying, you know, we should say the gospel message to them every single time we see them. But take our opportunities where they come, though. But we have to share. We have to share because we care about your soul. I would rather you be upset with me for a day or a week or a year and you to be right with God forever than to you to be lost and spend an eternity in damnation. Because we love people's souls. And if we think souls, that's the way we're going to be with them. And if we're bold, we're going to tell people and share with people the message of Jesus. Because their eternity matters. And boldness means we are willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. The individual who spoke in many of the sections we just read was Peter. We know Peter at some point, or at one point, wasn't willing to suffer for the cause of Christ, yet he would go on to suffer for Jesus, and he would go on to write some of the greatest things we've, we've ever read about suffering for Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 4, in verse 12, as he writes to a group of people who are being persecuted, torn apart from homes, exiled, some of them being uh, hurt and afflicted, and, and many of them being killed, he would say, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you as to, to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted, for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and God rest upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Peter was willing to suffer for Jesus' sake because he knew it was right. It's better to suffer for what is right than for doing what is wrong. He would say that in the book of 1 Peter 2. I'm willing to suffer for Jesus. I'm willing to suffer for Jesus, he would say, because Jesus suffered for me. He went through abuse and insults and ridicule and pain and beatings and death for me. And if he's willing to go through that for me, I have to be willing to go through suffering for him. Peter wasn't ashamed to suffer for Jesus. He was willing to glorify God in that moment. And that, this is a hard truth for us to understand because we're not persecuted like so many of the people we read about in Scripture. Their persecution and our persecution are vastly different, are they not? We hear these stories about our brethren in other parts of the world, and we can't even relate to it because of our freedoms. And I, we thank God for our freedoms, right? I mean, it's, we're blessed to, to come here and not be worried about what are they going to do to us because we're here. But that's not the case everywhere. But because we're not persecuted, we don't really know if we have the faith to walk through that door and suffer if persecution came. It might be in 50 years, this country is vastly different, where this is illegal. It might be in 20 years. Whenever it comes, or if it comes, are we willing to suffer for the, for the cause of Christ? Am I willing to tell my neighbor about Jesus? Am I willing to live faithfully, to follow the will of God, even if they hate it, even if they'll kill me, even if they'll imprison me, even if they'll fire me from my job? Because it's worth it, because it's the right thing to do. 
we face some persecution. We might be ridiculed and mocked today. We're labeled. And I'm sure some of you have experienced that. We lose friends. We lose relationships. I've known Christians who've lost their job, and you've seen it in the news before. They're sued. They go through lawsuits simply because they're standing on the Word of God. That might happen to us. But are we going to be bold? Are we going to back down? Or are we going to double down and say, this is where God wants me to stand, and I'm going to stand here? Christianity does not spread if we are not bold. It takes boldness. If we're not bold, we're a social club. And God doesn't need a social club. He needs a church that's willing to share His message. Church, our faith is not meant to stay inside these walls and stay amongst each other, but it's meant to be shared. It's meant to be shared in our community and our state and all over the world, in person and online. And that only happens if we're willing to be bold, to have some courage to live a different lifestyle than the people around us and not be ashamed of it. It takes some boldness to say something about Jesus. That might not be a sermon that looks like me, but simply just talking about Jesus and about His ways in conversations with other people, it takes courage. May we commit ourselves as a church to living boldly. Because a faithful church is a family, it's devoted to God's Word, it's generous, but a faithful church is bold. They're not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. And we can't be ashamed either. Something for all of us to think about as we close this morning. Would you know Jesus if it wasn't for a bold Christian? If it wasn't for someone who had the courage to say something to you that might have been uncomfortable, would you ever know Jesus? Some of you are thinking, well, my dad, <laughs> that's not really bold of my dad to tell his kid <laughs> about Jesus. But trace that line back. Because we never know about Jesus if it wasn't for the people we're standing on their shoulders who boldly told the story of Jesus to people. We can trace it all the way back to here. If it wasn't for a bold Christian, we would never know Jesus now think of it this way. There might be somebody in our world that will never know Jesus if you aren't bold. If I'm not bold, if I'm not willing to be courageous, there might be someone who lives day to day and never comes to know Jesus. Christians, we have to be bold. It's not time to back down. It's time to stand up. It's time to speak. It's time to double down. Because we have a wonderful God and a wonderful story and a wonderful lifestyle to live and a wonderful reward, and it's worth it. At the end of chapter 4, these Christians pray for boldness. When, when persecution came, they didn't pray for God to take it away. They prayed for God to give them a spirit to keep being bold. And so this morning, I would like to close by praying together that God would grant us a spirit of boldness. So would you pray with me? Father, we love you. We love your word. We love your will. We love you as being our Father, and God, we love your Son and, and what He sacrificed to make us your child. And God, we appreciate His courage to face the cross and face opposition and continue to face it for our sake and for your sake. And God, as a church, would you grant us a Christ-like spirit, one that is courageous and bold, courageous and living, faithfully to you, despite the culture around us and what they may think about it and how they may respond. And God, would you grant us a spirit of boldness to speak about Jesus, to talk about Jesus and to share his message despite how people may react or respond. God, help us to be willing to be uncomfortable for your sake, to be willing to get out of our comfort zones and share your message because God, you save souls. You redeem us and you can redeem all people and we want other people to experience this wonderful relationship that we have with you. And we want other people to know your love, to know your grace and mercy. God, give us a spirit of boldness. As a church, when we preach from the pulpit, as a church, when we go out amongst our neighbors and our friends and our family, give us courage, God. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. This morning, if you have a need, whether it is to obey the gospel, to become a Christian, whether it's to make a change in your life and you, you need encouragement, that might be to rededicate your life, or you simply need prayers for something going on, we would love to help you now while we stand and while we sing.